example will be that sonata. The second part is, um, in 2002, Nicola Harris was one of the students. She was maybe, what, 15 at the time, Tom, or 16 when she moved to Texas. And um, she uh, performed that, that day at our home, and, um, and she... She, she wrote something that I think we all, anybody who studied with Tom can relate to, but it was also very poignant and uh, very touching. And I'm going to just say thank you, Tom, for so much.
In the beginning, the notes are slow and hushed, simple in a beautiful way. Pronate, supinate, I think to my bow hand. Up bow, down bow, like waves upon the sand, like gentle breathing against a pillow. I remember what he's taught me. If I'm prepared, I need not worry. So I try to concentrate on the music in front of me. His reminders that look like scribbles fill the margins. Many of the once black and white notes are now rainbow, <laughs> shaded by a spectrum of highlighters. Vibrato, I hear him shout from deep in my memory. Vibrato, more vibrato. I need more vibrato, I ask desperately. He nods, sighing, I imagine energy is flowing like water from my back to my hands, and my fingers are trembling like leaves on a tree. The words run through my mind like a pre-recorded message. Vibrato, an alteration of pitch. Alterations of pitch in music add color, warmth, and maturity to a sound. Alterations and changes in life add color, warmth, and maturity to a soul. My vibrato increases. The notes crescendo, keep your bow hair flat. His mantra for me haunts my brain. Yet I know that without flat bow hair, my sound will be through it. My son will be timid and shy and afraid. I must play with my bow hair flat and my violin up. I must play with confidence. And I must always stand with my feet flat on the ground and my chin up. I must not be timid, shy, or afraid to voice my thoughts and opinions. I must speak with confidence. I turn my bow so the hair is flat. I look ahead in my music and see it coming. The hard part, the fast part. At first I panic, but then I remember his words. If I have confidence in myself, I can play any notes. I can accomplish anything. I finish the finger flying passage successfully, but then I remember the shift of the fingerboard, the shift that always causes trouble. Shifting is the distance that the arm moves. I hear it echo through my head, arm under and up, Hand around, aim for the top. And I make it. I finish with flair, and a smile spreads across my face. The audience claps, and I say to myself, who would have thought they would enjoy listening to my music? But they did, and nothing compares to the satisfaction, pride, and happiness felt after accomplishing what I set out to accomplish. He knew I could do it, and I know I couldn't have done it without him. I couldn't have done it without my teacher. This piece was dedicated to him. It began years ago when he started teaching me, and it ended when I was carried out to sea on the waves of change. But my concert is not over. This last note was only the beginning, a beginning he has inspired. His music will never leave me, for he has taught me more than marks on a page. He has taught me to find confidence in each note I play. And even when I'm far out at sea, jostled with ocean storms, or still with summer's calm, he will always be there with me, for his music will always be in mine. Um, about a year ago, Tom and I were driving to the mall to buy my mother some perfume, and we were chatting about his life. I was asking him a lot of questions, and I said, you know, one of those really stupid questions you ask musicians, I said, well, do you have a favorite thing you've ever done on your violin or in a group? And 
his answer was so sweetly sincere. Um, he just paused for a second and he said, oh Lynn, I love everything I've ever done with that instrument. <laughs> um, and I think that tonight we really saw a tribute to that passion um, in his students. That all by itself would be legacy enough for anybody to leave. But a lot of you know me because you've heard from me via your computers. So I've been sending you emails saying if you have memories of Tom, things that, you know, ways he's, you know, touched your life or anything you want to tell me, please send it to me in an email. And a number of you responded. Those of you who didn't, or those of you who wrote to me this morning, <laughs> um, I, I loosely bound these because I thought that might happen. And there's still time. You can still send me other things. But what really struck me as I was reading through these things is um, everyone, everyone said Tom is a fabulous teacher, um, that they, he changed their life because of that. Um, but I want to just you know, sort of read the end of just three or four of these. Um, the end of this one says, um, what I remember most about Tom is that we always laughed a lot, and his is a friendship. I know I can always count on. I'm a better person because of who he is. Um, thank you, Tom, for being as you are. Um, I can tell you that Tom changed my life, life deeply. He is not only my teacher, he is my best friend and my mentor. Um, bravo, Tom, and thank you from everyone who's ever known you. You know, it would be legacy enough just to watch that passion lived out in musician after musician after musician. Um, but I can say that Tom is one of really only a handful of people that I can honestly say, since the moment I've known him, he has loved me very, very well. So I'm opening this up to you guys to come say what you wish. My mom has assured me that there are some of you who want to come do this. Um, and I would just like to add my own bravo. We love you, Tom. I'm going to force my brother to start if no one comes. So. Probably, I don't know, the, it was early 90s, right after Mom and Tom started seeing each other. Well, not started seeing each other. They were seeing each other before I was born. But anyway, uh, it was after they got together again. Um, anyway, uh, so we took off driving in the car to Miami. I got a ticket right before I left Charlotte. Well, like, this might have been a bad idea. Anyway, so we get close to Miami. About 100 miles from Miami, I started noticing people were driving crazy. So, anyway, I was like, the farther I got, the closer I got to Miami, the crazier they were driving. And I was like, people were coming behind me, like, I'd see somebody a mile back, I'd be doing 80, and in two minutes they were past me. People on motorcycles, no helmets, passing me, zigging in and out. I was sweating. I was like, I'm never going to make it. We're not going to make it there. We're not going to make it. So, we finally made it, and I think it took me the rest of that day to calm down. But anyway, after I did calm down, I think the next day... Uh, Mom said, why don't you and Tom go somewhere? Go here, go there. I was like so happy just to get in the car with somebody else driving instead of me. And anyway, so that, that was the first thing I remember about Tom is I got in the car with him and after about two blocks, I figured out who had taught all these nuts in Miami how to drive. <laughs> anyway, now I actually love driving with Tom. I love driving around with Miami with the crazies, but that was my first memory of Tom. So that's my memory, and uh, ever since then we've been good, good buddies, and we've had a lot of good times. And he's a great musician and a great person. Thanks, Tom.
Tom, but there you are. Um, I went to the University of Wisconsin. I was a small town boy from Wausau, Wisconsin. I went to the University of Wisconsin in Madison in 1970. So Tom has been 40 years. Um, and I uh, was a cello student. And I would pass Tom in the hall, and he was always had a wonderful smile. And we may not have said three or four words in the two years I was in Wisconsin. Flash forward to 1997 uh, or 8, and I was looking for a violinist in, in Miami. And one of my adult students said, well, you should use Tom Moore. He's got the 60th Street Players. I said, Tom Moore? I mean, how many Tom Moores that play violin are there in the world? So I called him up. I hadn't seen him probably since 1972. And uh, I said, uh, this is Michael Andrews. You probably don't remember me, but I was a student there. He said, oh, yeah, I remember you. He was always so generous and cordial. And uh, I remember you, yes. And uh, I said, well, I've got a chamber music ensemble. I started called the South Beach Chamber Ensemble. He said, yes. And I said, well, I'm looking for a violin, you know, violin player. And uh, he said, OK. And I said, well, would you be interested in playing a concert for free? <laughs> and he thought about for 10 seconds and said, of course I would. So um, that was our first concert in 1997. And uh, he's been a joy to work with. And uh, he was the first person. He always reads the paper in the morning. And he sent me clippings of things. And he called me one morning and said, you got to go to this grant panel meeting in Miami Beach. They're giving away half a million dollars. He said, you need that money. <laughs> and uh, so I said, okay. So I'd never written a grant before in my life. I went to the meeting, and uh, on the way back, I thought of Music in Beautiful Spaces. And uh, this year is our 13th annual Music in Beautiful Spaces, and uh, I owe it all to Tom because I went to a grant panel meeting in Miami Beach in 1997. And uh, we've gotten our grant every year from Miami Beach, and uh, then I expanded to the Dan Grant with the county and then state grants that Tom and I could go to South America to uh, tour. And uh, Tom, I love you. You've been a wonder and uh, great to work with and a huge inspiration. classical music to me. I remember with one great joy in my life, one of the highlights of my whole life was one day he called me when I was sitting in my office, drooling over my cup of tea in the afternoon, trying to wake up. And he said, oh, what are you doing? I said, not much. Why don't you come over and see me? I said, well, all right. He didn't say why. Get over to his office up there, and he has these two crazy looking little violins. He said, I'm going to play you a piece on each violin and see which one you like. I thought, oh my goodness, I'm going to do the violin. He proceeded to play me the most fabulous little piece on each violin. Well, which one do you like? I said, well, I like that one. He said, well, that's where it is. That's the inexpensive one. How much is that? About $350,000. I said, what? <laughs> he says, yes, that's the Bonari. He says, the first one was the Stradivarius. I said, hey, there's a big one you like that. But thank God I like the little one. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Moore has always meant to me classical music in person and live today. It flows through and it flows around him, and it's wonderful for me to see the influence he's had on this community and on those around him. Thank you very much, Dr. Hi, I'm Catherine Lehman from the Kalani Summer Music Festival, and I have known Tom since 1999 first year I taught in the summer festival and he has had a profound 
influence on me, which is merely a small part of the profound influence he has had on Sewanee. I know a lot of you have connections with Sewanee. Uh, certainly saw that in, in the notes today. And so what we, what I did, um, we, we prepared a little scrapbook for you, Tom, of um, everything we could find in uh, the history of, of, of your years, your many summers at Sewanee, starting back in 1975 and continuing up through 2006. And um, I'm just going to read a little letter, I'm assuming that the light is adequate. I'm going to read a little letter that, um, that is in the front of this book that, uh, that we, on behalf of Swanee, uh, bring to you today. Dear Tom, on behalf of the Swanee Summer Music Festival, it is my great pleasure to give you this small memento of your many Sewanee years. The letters, photos, and programs enclosed can only hint at the extent of your impact on Sewanee. In a short five weeks each summer, you mentored countless students, skillfully developing their talents and lovingly guiding their musical lives. You have inspired us all with brilliant performances, from the Archduke to L'Histoire, you have been a valued colleague and a source of inspiration for all of us who have had the pleasure of working with you. On a personal note, Tom, you had a great impact on my early teaching. You were central to the core of Sewanee faculty who came here each summer, setting aside their personal interests, putting in long hours each day, all for little pay, and a room at scenic Trezevant Hall. We won't even mention the cuisine at the old Gaylor Dining Hall. <laughs> you were free with your time, with both students and colleagues, and in particular gave me the benefit of much wisdom over the years. You exemplified a true devotion to music and to teaching that is unique in the profession, and therefore uniquely Sewanee. Your work will have a lasting impact here. The Swanee Summer Music Festival enters its 55th year, much strengthened by your years here and all that you have given to us. We wish to express our tremendous gratitude to you and will endeavor to do so by carrying on your legacy of great teaching and joyous music ma making. With much love from all of Sewanee. I'm from Ecuador, and I met Tom uh, this uh, coming March 21 years ago. <coughs> he really changed my life. Uh, when I met him, I was playing the violin, but I have already given up becoming a violinist. Uh, you know, being born in Ecuador, you know, having a son that plays the violin is not a great idea for a parent. <laughs> and my, my family is a Lebanese; they are business oriented, so I said, you have to be an economist, you have to start a business. So I already said, okay, you know, I was gonna do that. We decided to come on a vacation here in uh, 89, and I called the University of Miami looking, and I thought I would, I would get some private lessons. And uh, they said, oh, you should talk to Mr. Moore. So I called Tom Moore, went there, said he needs some private teaching, and he started playing for Tom. It was such a great experience. Uh, he was such a nice guy, very kind. And he told me, why do you come and study with me? I said, gee, it's a big decision. It's a, it's a whole change of uh, uh, perspective in life. I said, come over. You know, I think you, you have talent. You should just study violin. So I went back to Ecuador and told my father, you know, I'm going to Miami to study violin. He says, <laughs> <laughs> I said, how, what are you going to do? How are you going to survive? I said, I don't know. It's, let me study first and we'll see later. So I came here in, the, in, in January 1990, and I thought, man, if, if this guy liked my playing, I must be good. <laughs> so I come to the first lesson, you know, say, okay, now, everything you have done in your life in violin, forget it. <laughs> you mean forget it. Just say, forget it. We're going to teach you how to hold the violin. <laughs> so basically, I started with Tom from zero up. Zero. He taught me how to hold the violin, how to hold the bow, how to really how to play the violin. And everything I have done on the violin is thanks to him. He is not only my teacher, he's my mentor, he's my best friend, 
He's my compadre because he's the godfather of my second daughter. He has been in the most important uh, uh, moments of my life. In the turning point of deciding to be a violinist, he was in my wedding. He even played the waltz in my wedding. He came to Ecuador for the wedding. He came to Ecuador for the baptism of his goddaughter. And we keep in very, very close contact. And actually, I think I know a side of Tom that nobody knows. We've been in business together. <laughs> and we lost money together, too. <laughs> Tom, uh, you are a great teacher. But beyond being a great teacher, you're a great human being. You gave me one lesson one day. I don't know if you remember this. Um, I had the bad habit of going home for a lunch and a nap. So one day, we have in the uh, string uh, section us, and Tom was conducting that. And I came home, I had my lunch, I had my nap, and then I was, of course, as a Latin, running late, and driving like a maniac. Where, where is uh, uh, Sandra? Eh, okay. Yeah, yeah, he's also my mentor in driving, huh? <laughs> so so I, I, I got the car, I drove like a maniac to the university, I, I walked into the rehearsal hall, and he was already rehearsing, we were playing Scheherazade. I don't remember one part, what part it was, but it was one of the toughest parts. You know? And I get there, you know, trying not to make noise and sit in the back of the violin section and just play, you know. And so he stops. I say, Jorge, could you play the passage? And I look at him like, what? He said, play it. So I, you know, played it, but of course I couldn't play it. You know? So it was a mess, a disaster. And he looked at me, do it again. And I look at him like, what? <laughs> do it again. I played again. Of course, it was worse than the first time. <laughs> so he looked at me and he said, play it again. And I said, of course, I didn't say that. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I couldn't play it twice. I think I wanna... So I went a third time and it was even worse. So he said, OK, I want to hear, I want to listen to that passage, the next, re the next uh, uh, string uh, section. After the, the, the rehearsal, I went there and said, Tom, why did you do that to me? He said, Jorge. You are my friend, and I love you dearest, but you are my student. I don't want you to think that because you are my friend that you can get away of not practicing. So that's why I have to show you that you have to practice. It doesn't matter how much I love you, especially because I love you, you have to be the best one. So that was a tough lesson to play like that for your friends, but the next time I came for section, I said, I'm gonna play solo the passage. <laughs> Tom, um, I love you, my family love you, you know your part, huh? So he has to play the second time? No, the, sec the second time he didn't ask me to play, so I started to say, hey, hey, I need to play the passage. <laughs> I need to clear up my name here. <laughs> but Tom, um, you know you're part of my family. I have you dear in, in my heart. Uh, you're, I don't have a big a mark of Tom Moore, I have a big scar from Tom Moore. And uh, you know that you always have a home in Ecuador, that we miss you. You and Sandra have been invited 20 times. I'm still waiting for you two to come to Ecuador. I've seen you bungee jumping in Africa and not coming to Ecuador. <laughs> but we have to have you over there. Man, we love you. situation, left, returned with his violin, and we had our trio session. I was impressed. By the late 90s, he extended an invitation to participate in a chamber music workshop with performances for the public, and it was a joy to play fine music in a group where the advanced musicians pulled the rest of us along. And a concert drew a respectable <coughs> number of listeners. 
The seasons were too short, and the 60th Street Players is a very fond memory. Some years later, this is a sign you haven't heard about yet today, Tom was elected president of the Florida chapter of American String Teachers. This was not an easy task. And for many busy professionals, they just say, oh, I'm sorry, it's a good idea, but I'm, I'm, I'm not much too busy. He served for two years, which is the term. He led with great strength. He supervised expanding the structure of the organization into state regions each with responsibilities to their own constituents and a, low, and a list of proposed objectives. Hurricane Andrew visited us early in that term of his, and he led us through rescheduling our major events of celebration. Yes, celebration is a ton of cellos. <laughs> and supervised a recovery effort for the stricken string teachers of South Dade. Money and equipment were collected and distributed, and a luncheon was held for those recovering. Remember that at all? <laughs> uh, of his regional objectives for the state, a re and having divided it into geographical groups where you can actually see another teacher instead of having them be 700 miles away, the uh, recital was held by students of many teachers who may not even have known each other. One region helped sponsor a music medicine seminar Student chapters were formed, a pre-all-state workshop developed, and a mission statement was accepted. That sounds very much like some of these, these attributes of Tom. To create a larger community of string musicians, teachers, and students who, regardless of organizational affiliation, we have that catch that, regardless of, of organizational affiliation, will work together for the benefit of all. An unexpected but welcome result, the state membership increased 28% during his term. The town of Miami Lakes also benefited from Tom's talent and organization. It was a new town in 2003, and we had a fledgling music series, and as chair, I invited Tom to bring his La Corda Ensemble to be our second group to perform. A church filled to hear an evening of Brahms performed by Tom Richard Fleischman, David Cole, and Michael Gert, and set the tone for the level of music we could bring to our citizens in the future. In recent years, it has been my pleasure to hear Tom's student recitals. Never disappointing, the range of performers' ages seems larger than the range of performance, meaning no matter the age or years of study, the music was delightful and an inspiration to hear. That means that people who aren't even having to just watch their beginning child come, that people come to hear that child's music because it's been done so well. May there be many more music lovers who have an opportunity to work with and to hear Tom Moore. Uh, my name is Kurt Thompson. Sorry, I'm one of the Sewaneeites. I spent five summers at Sewanee. Wherever that Sewanee uh, journal is, I'd like to take a look at it. Uh, I, was, I was 13, I believe it was, when I studied for five weeks with Tom, Mr. Moore, T.D. Moore, by some of his family members. And I was in search of a violin teacher at home. I grew up in Arkansas, and I went through a series of five violin teachers in five years. Uh, desperate to find someone who could really shape me. And Tom certainly started that process. But he said, I, I think that was sort of a lackluster summer for me, to tell you the truth, because I discovered girls. <laughs> and uh, my mother was a dorm mother at Sewanee that, that year, which definitely curtailed some of my activities. <laughs> but together they conspired and put me on, I don't remember what it's called, maybe you can help me, it's a recital hour. You volunteer to present yourself uh, in a noontime concert. Something to that effect. And my mother and Tom thought it was a great idea and a, a big motivator if I were signed up for this without knowing about it. So I found out about it. I would play Preludium and Allegro on that concert. And I remember we had a couple of lessons. We had enough, I had enough lead time to know that it was coming. And I guess it went better than, than it had a right to. Because after that performance, you recommended that I study with your first cousin, Joy Wiener, in Memphis. 
through the city. And when one looks back at the, the people in, in life that have made pivotal differences, you certainly are one of them, and Mrs. Weiner, you are certainly another. And four years of study in, with, with Joy, Mrs. Weiner, uh, just two things I want to tell you about that. I, after my freshman year at Indiana, I came back, and almost by accident, we discovered that my teacher at Indiana, Nellie Skolnikova, had won, and I believe you took second prize to her at Jacques Thibault competition in Paris, and then a couple of weeks later, or some short time later, you won the George Inesco competition, I believe. I'm not, I'm, correct my fact. But another thing that you all should know about uh, Tom and Joy's family um, is there is an Elvis connection. <laughs> How many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay, a few, but not many. Okay, Miss Weiner, you may have to help me with this. I can get But Graceland, the home of Elvis Presley, was named after your great aunt Grace, is that correct? Elvis bought Graceland from the family. And I remember we discussed this at your house, and I said, oh, I can't wait to get over to Graceland. So I used to have Sunday dinner, which is lunch every weekend at that house, but after that man bought it, I wouldn't <laughs> send a photo. But for everyone here, can you clarify Tom's relationship in your family to that? What it is, we call him TD, and that's because he was named for his uncle, who was Thomas David Moore. He was a urologist. And he is the one who acquired the land from Grace Brown, my sister, our father, uncle, and Aunt Ruth, who had married T.D. Moore. And he is the one who built Graceland. So that is the connection. And the only disappointment that, that I'm thinking tonight that we missed was that we did have large family gatherings. We have another first cousin who is, was a really wonderful harpist. She studied with Carlos Salcedo at Curtis Institute and did some concertizing with him. And we would go to Graceland and my mother, and I think Tom T would admit that maybe Chug had a little influence on your life too. Uh, we had all this music on all the big holidays, Christmas, Easter, Fourth of July, Thanksgiving, you name it. And Mel and TD did not live in Memphis, so you really were never <laughs> a part of that. And boy, look at the duets we missed. <laughs> anyway, this, this has really been very special to, to hear all of this said about TD. Obviously, I'm older. And I knew when he came along, and it was very obvious, we have quite a bit of music in this Moore family. And T.D. is a real highlight of that whole tribe. <laughs> and we are very proud of you, T.D. You really had a remarkable career. And I just wish that I could have shared more times, even musically, with you. And hope maybe we'll do better. <laughs> I feel a little inadequate getting up. I project. And uh, I studied music through high school. And I, I tell people I, I, I studied enough music to, to appreciate investing in it in my children. And my lovely wife, who really had very little background, ran into a Suzuki violin teacher in, in Dallas and somehow got our five kids into Suzuki violin. And I remember, and that would have been 16 years ago, um, realizing that we had basically just traded a lot of TV time for my wife playing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star with two and three of my 
kids that later became five. And, uh, but what a great blessing. In, in 2005, almost six years ago, you know, first, first of the year, we moved to Miami. New opportunities, new careers. We left Dallas, and Dallas had a very, very mature musical environment. Kids were studying piano with the piano teacher they loved. They had kind of the progression of violin teachers there that kind of, we, we knew what we were doing. We knew who we were supposed to take from. It was, it was all very easy. Everybody told you where you were supposed to be. We came to Miami, and, and I, I was busy working, you know, and, and I don't know how my wife did it, but uh, somehow she found a piano teacher first. We were really struggling to find string teachers. You know, by now we had you know, three violinists, a violist, and a cellist. And we had a little string quartet uh, in the beginning. And uh, I remember driving out to Fort Lauderdale to try to find a cello teacher, a violin teacher. Just I remember driving there once. I knew this isn't going to work. This is not going to work. Everything we've invested, 10 years of music, 10 years of strings, 10 years of violin, and I don't know where it's going to land here in Miami. We just struggled to find, and um, much to the chagrin of our, viol of our piano teacher, she recommended Tom Moore, and we came over, and uh, what an oasis. It made us realize that there was a reason for us to be here. Because if we hadn't found Tom, we would have known we would have lost something very, very significant for our family. By the way, I should introduce myself as, as Rachel's dad. Um, but uh, thank you, Tom. You know, it's uh, we needed you, and you're there, and you and you provided for us what what we really needed, and it's uh, it's made our experience in Miami, a, a fruitful one, and one that we, we love dearly. And uh, all I can say is, not only bravo, but encore. We want more. And I knew we were in a really great place. We'd been recommended by somebody from Interlock, and we were good. But I want to talk about the things that you've actually taught the parents. So I know more about dark chocolate and the kinds of dark chocolate. I've had more articles, more samples from the finest makers of chocolate in the world that you could have ever taught me. That's one thing you've taught me. Political commentary. Tom, you are so well read that when I have the pleasure of sitting in my daughter's lessons, I also get educated. Because at the medical school, we don't talk about politics right now. It's not a good place for docs to be talking about politics. But you're talking to me about energy conservation and uh, you know uh, education of children and all kinds of things. And then you've got these great magazines that that Sandra brings in there for us to also get enriched. And then we get all this wonderful enrichment from the paintings and the watercolors. And we hear about the watercolor society. And we, we, we just get totally enriched. But that's just on the surface of what you do. And I, I know that Linda and Roseanne and Pam are all sitting in this room thinking, you really taught us how to be great parents. Not to make our children practice or just to make sure they do what they do, but how to practice, how to take time, how to care, how to have passion for what you do. And I don't think any of us could ever thank you enough for giving us that gift.
at 94, I had never intended to talk. I'm well past it. But with witnessing what's going on here, I just can't resist because I witnessed a dramatic program change and affect an entire community because of the presence of Tom Moore. And I just have to say something about it. I came to University of Wisconsin in 1966 after being at Boston University and the founder and the conductor for a number of years of the Greater Boston New Symphony and also at the University of Kentucky before that and played professionally in orchestras. Uh, my appointment in Wisconsin was when two-thirds school community in charge of a string and orchestral development program for the state, which included the founding of the Wisconsin Symphony Orchestra. This was the fall of 1966. We put together an 80-piece orchestra, pretty good with winds and brasses. In the violin section, there were, we had 21 violins coming from a radius of over 100 miles. The concert master, in that year, I think, I think there was evidence there studying privately. It was pretty bad. I initiated a concerto program that year in the spring, and we put one violin player just to have a string player on, and she barely struggled through the Bach E minor first movement concerto. I mean, she really struggled, and she was the concert master. Wambo Kim was the violin teacher at Rudolph Kohlisch at that time on faculty and, and involved the Pro Art Quartet, which had really very little effect on the younger program there. Uh, Kohlisch retired that year. Norman Pelton took his place. Wambo Kim at the last minute decided to take a year's leave of absence for me for his state, for his doctorate. And so we had a one year interim appointment for the Polar Quartet and University Violin Faculty. I called a number of friends, including Gordon Epperson, who had gotten his doctorate at Boston University while I was there in Cholo. He was in an Ohio State. And he told me about Tom. He says, I think you might get him for a one-year interim appointment. And that's how Tom came to Madison. And what a dramatic difference it made immediately. Not only the university faculty, but I was concerned about that youth orchestra. By the third and fourth year, or I should say, one more decided not to come back because he didn't want to play second violin in the Pro Art Quartet. So Tom was given a faculty appointment after a one-year interim appointment. Now, just to let you know, by the third year of that orchestra, we had 36 violins, all of them studied privately, and kids like Sharon and Sarah Usher, who are, he's also here, a violinist in San Francisco, were products that started to show up immediately. The first year, barely Bach. Most of them could hardly play the Vivaldi A minor violin concerto first movement. By the third and fourth year, we had kids playing Wieniawski, violin concerto, Lalo, Sensan, and so on. Every one of them were Tom Moore students. He made an immediate, dramatic contact and made it possible for me to feel successful in the development of that youth orchestra. It was so great. But I had also so much admiration for him. Uh, I had what was called a national 
this food workshop in 25 years. We didn't have any idea of a violin teacher pedagogue in that particular program because it was geared for the public school class teachers. Tom was on that faculty, made a tremendous difference in this. But the thing that I see is what his impact on young people, which you had testimony. But I saw a dramatic difference of practically nothing in the community and it changed almost overnight. I'm eternally grateful for Tom Moore for that, for what he has done for young people. Thank you, Tom. Hi, I'm Francesca Rossi, and um, I've been studying with Mr. Moore for about four years now, I guess, and um, he's helped me grow as a person, not only as a violinist, but as a person, and at lessons, I've learned things about life, and he's, um, he's more than a teacher, and I know we've been hearing that all night tonight, but <laughs> four years ago, I wouldn't have come up here to say anything. I was really shy, and he's taught me to be confident in myself, not only as a violinist, but as a person, and I just want to thank you. I love you. teacher uh, said I should come and, and play for you. And I did, and several things came out of that. I remember him telling me that I was playing, my belly was moving a lot. I got that taken care of, I just lost the belly. Um, in any case, uh, <clears throat> before anything was settled, uh, the topic of what the wages would be for the lessons came up, and it was discussed between my parents and him. And my parents decided that just was not gonna be possible at that time, and Tom Moore took me as a student anyway. And I had over a year and a half of lessons with him. Um, and I just wanna say uh, we're just out of love and trust in what I had to offer as a violin, so I appreciate that very much, thank you. And uh, in those years, I, I studied with him for, I want to say, five years before I um, went to University of Miami. And so many things happened to me, with you, that, uh, you know, I keep you people here for too long and get bored. But, mm -hmm. you know, we were talking about Tennessee and your aunt and crazy driving. All these things come together. I don't know if you remember, for instance, uh, an incident with two huge uh, 18 wheelers and your Civic <laughs> going to your aunt's birthday party from Swanee <clears throat> or waking up at 4.30 to pick up berries in Tennessee. So a lot of things. Uh, but last year what I want to say is uh, 1994 I graduated from high school and my parents <coughs> thought it would be a good idea for me to have a nice present and that present was going to Paris. I stayed in Paris. At we had lodging, which was great, and I was there for four weeks, uh, and Tom went with me for three of those weeks. Um, we went to museums, went to concerts, and all that, but really, I think one of the highlights of that trip um, was his gift to me as uh, a graduate. It was a ticket to the Pink Floyd concert, <laughs> and it was a great performance. Uh, we were decided the only two people in that crowd that were not under any kind of narcotic. <laughs> <laughs> but it was still a lot of fun. So thank you for everything you've done for me and everything you do for a lot of other people. Thank you very much. I'm going to call time. 
for the diehards that have stayed for, uh, I think now, going on five hours. Um, I really, I asked Tom for permission to speak. I hadn't planned to speak. But since you've stayed this long, I'll tell you a few things. Uh, some of them are a little salacious. So maybe you'll like that, maybe you won't. Um, except for, I guess, Ramel and Joy. I've known Tom longer than anybody in the room, maybe Grace. Uh, we met each other when we were six years old, and we shot marbles together outside of Wiley School in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. He lost his southern accent. Obviously, I did not. <laughs> um, he was very cute. He, he skipped a grade. And uh, I was older than he was when we met each other in the sixth grade. I was 12 and he was 11. He wasn't quite interested in girls yet, but I thought he was very cute. And he was a violinist. I couldn't seem to get his attention. And my my father was very musical, so I said to my father, I was very manipulating even then, I said, I, I believe I'll, I'll, I was playing the piano a little bit. I said, I believe I'll start playing the violin. <laughs> and, and sure enough, I got T.D.'s attention. And um, we were boyfriend and girlfriend for about a year. But remember, I was older and he was very shy. He's, he's a very shy person if you don't know that, he still is. And I was very, he was very shy, and, and at about age 13, and I was 12, uh, he was, I was 13, he was 12, I said to him, when are you gonna kiss me? <laughs> and being a very conservative, religious person, he said, when we get married. <laughs> and I promptly uh, dumped him. <laughs> Now, I won't tell you all the years in between, except we're both grateful because we went our different ways. He did play for my wedding to my first husband, Bill Taylor, and for that I had three beautiful children. Lynn, you've already met. My son, David, you've already met. Michael couldn't be here. Uh, Tom has two beautiful children from his first wife, Flo. Britt, whose wine you may be drunk tonight, and his, and his daughter Beth, who could not be here. But so we're grateful that we went our separate ways. But after um, now 60 years, uh, I'm still his least advanced student. <laughs> he makes tapes of me. I haven't played uh, the viola or the violin for about 50 years until we got together again in 1995, and I'll, that's another long story. But this is the, the salacious part of the story that now that you've waited for five hours, you certainly <laughs> need to know this, and it's a, it's a very, I think, fine and wonderful ending to the story. He has pursued me since several marriages between both of us, and it's not seven, it's not seven. My students said, oh, Dr. Walsh has been married seven times. No. He, he and I have both been married twice, so that's part of the salaciousness of all of this. But I moved to Miami after he pursued me for some time, after he was divorced for the second time. I moved to Miami, and we decided that the marriage was not working out. So we would give it a try to be partners. And we've been giving it a try. We've been introducing ourselves as man and wife for all these years. And it's been working out quite well. But um, given the turn of events and given the fact that he really has been asking me to marry him for all these years, then I, I, I'm, I, we aren't married yet. But the secret is that on January 1, 1911, which will be 16 years, 2011, which will be 16 years from the day he first called me in Greenville, North Carolina with a um, anonymous message that was very lovely, but for a long time he didn't identify who he was. On January 1st, 2011, 
will finally on our balcony with a few friends there um, make it legal. Yeah. So, so I, I, I already have the priest's permission. I'm already wearing the ring. <laughs> so so we, are, we aren't going to change our mind, and we've already got the marriage license. And um, he's pursued me for a long time. We're very grateful of the lives we've had previously. We're grateful for all we've learned. But mostly, I'm grateful for Tom because I'm a person that always sees things, the glass is sort of half empty. And of course, you all know him. He's always half full. So it's, he's been such a wonderful inspiration for me, and I intend to learn, continue to learn a lot more from him. I love you. My name is Brenda Hutchins, and I can't let my older sister get the last word. <laughs> She's not a lot older, but she is a little bit older. I've known T.D., I, I just cannot get used to calling him Tom, but I've known him almost as long as she has, and I'm just so glad that he came into her life. First of all, I need to tell you that he treats her like any of you would love to be treated, just like a queen, and he really knows how to do that. I also want to thank all the musicians. I, I just, I'm kind of a musician. I play a little bit of piano and I play the flute. But I'm telling you, those fingers <coughs> on the violin, some of them I, I just could not, I just could not take in. I thought all of you were wonderful. I'm, I just not, would not have missed this for anything in the world. The one thing that T.D. and I have in common is that we love good fruit. And he even called me the other day. I live in North Carolina. And he even called me the other day and said, the strawberries are in so you can pick. I've already been to the place right before we got on the freeway and gotten some Honey Bell oranges. So I'm grateful for that, and I'm just the most grateful. I also have to tell you that my sister has gotten a lot of awards for her nursing, and she's gotten a lot of awards for her watercolors, which are just lovely. If none of you have seen them, you need to have at least one of them. I have a house full of them that she's given me, and I certainly appreciate that. I do appreciate everybody being here. And I just think that this is a special night for everybody, a special afternoon and night, that we could be all a part of this. And I love you, T.D. Okay, we really and truly are done. Thank you. If you, if you signed the guest book coming in, you've already signed it. If you haven't and you have time to stay for a second, it's right back there, kind of in, uh, those last two tables. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you all for being here.